Thanks for tuning in with us at Dream City Church Omaha. For further information, including past sermons, visit us online at dreamcityomaha.church. We hope you enjoy the message and that it has a positive impact on your life. Uh, today we are going to continue our series. Uh, before we do, how many how many Chiefs fans? Like that's it. Oh, there's like four of you. Anybody pulling for the Titans today? One person. Two people are pulling for the Titans. Uh, how about the Packers? Hey, easy. How, anybody pulling for the 49ers? All right. There's the real saved people. The rest of you? We'll have an altar call at the end of service. Um, this morning we are going to continue our series entitled Restart. And, uh, and we've been talking the last couple of weeks. Pastor Angel started us off at the beginning of the year and, and said if we're going to move forward in 2020, 2020, we have to move forward with the, the proper vision and how that vision is, is visual acuity. It's not just what we see, but it's what our mind tells us about what we see and how we interpret that. So we talked about not listening to the lies, and that was a couple weeks ago. And last week, we, we talked about how, how that God has made us three-part beings, that we are body, we are soul, and we are spirit. And we went back to the garden to look at how God breathed the breath of life into Adam. And when, when he, he created him from the dust and breathed spirit into him, that in that moment that he became a living soul. And we talked about how that the, the soul can affect the physical and the spiritual, but when we give our hearts to the Lord, when we profess faith in Jesus, our spirit is made alive. We find that in the New Testament. And because my spirit has now been made alive, I'm no longer a slave to sin because I don't have to live according to my selfish desires, but now I have the opportunity to live according to what God wants rather than what I want. And so if you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to go and, and find that message either on the app, uh, on the website, on YouTube, however it is that you want to find that. Check that out. But today we're going to be, we're going to be continuing. We're going to finish up this series entitled Restart, asking the questions, how can I move forward in 2020? What does that look like? What are some things that, that I can do to move forward? And how many you know sometimes to move forward, you've got to change some stuff? Like we don't, we don't like talking about that. We don't like, as humans, we don't like talking about change, but if we don't change, you know what happens? You stay the same, and if you stay the same, you become mediocre. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live a mediocre life. I don't want to lead a mediocre church. I don't want to have a mediocre marriage. I don't want to be a mediocre parent. I don't want to have a mediocre bank account. I don't want anything in my life to just be mediocre. And the only way, listen, the only way that, that you can fight mediocrity in your life is to change. Change is the antidote for mediocrity. You need to hear that today. Because so many times we come in and it's like the same thing over and over and over getting the same result that we've always got. And we come to church and it's like, God, I, yeah, I, I want to live like that. But we're not willing to change anything. Like, how come my life is this way? Because you haven't changed anything in the last 30 years. Because you're still doing the same things that you were doing. No, 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 listen, I understand. Change is, change is uncomfortable. Nobody likes change. Change is painful at times. Hello. I totally understand that. The reason I don't go to the dentist is because it's uncomfortable and it's painful and it's annoying and it's change and I don't like that. I'll just continue, just I'll brush, I'll brush, I'll floss once every couple of weeks. Like I don't floss daily and some of you are looking at me like, like you do. Good for you. I don't, and 97% of us probably don't either. Thank you, those of you that are honest enough about your dental hygiene to raise your hands right now and back me up here. But we don't, we don't like change, but here's, here's the thing. You know, we, we all have to change at some point. And the only, the only way, listen, the only way we do change is when the pain of the status quo becomes greater than the pain involved in changing. Say, so what do you, what do you, what do you mean? Like you just, I, I don't, not following you. Okay, 
Have you ever, have you ever gone out to your car, looked at your tires, noticed the tread getting low on your tires and thought, I think I can make it one more season. How many of you guys have done that? Myself included, right? We, we, we do that. Why? Because changing the tires is painful. It's going to cost me $600 to $1,200, depending on the tire, depending on what kind of vehicle I drive. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost me in my time. Somebody's going to have to pick me up, drop me off at the tire place, then take me home, only for a couple of hours later to get a phone call. They're going to have to pick me back up at the house, take me back. Are you following me? Like, nobody wants to go through that. I'm going to have to give up an entire day just to change my tires. I don't want to do that. So I think I can make it one more season until you're driving down the expressway after the first snow of the year and you see brake lights in front of you and you don't slam the brakes, you simply tap the brakes. And as you tap the brakes, you begin to do 360s down the expressway and everything is moving in slow motion. And you're thinking, how did I get here? You finally come to a stop only to realize that you didn't hit anything and nobody hit you. And so you take your foot off the brake and slowly push on the gas to get going back home. And you drive 20 miles an hour the rest of the way home. You say, Pastor John, that sounds like a very specific story. It may or may not be. But if that was you, listen, if that was you and you've gone out and you've evaluated, you looked at your tires and my tires need to be changed, but it's painful. I think I can get one more season. You're driving, you, you get into this non-accident accident. What do, you, what do you do the next morning? Go change my tires. Why? Because the pain of changing is now less than the pain of the status quo. If I continue to operate the way that I've always operated, it's going to be painful in some way. And the only time we change is when that pain is greater than the pain involved in changing. That's why so many times in marriages, we get ourselves to this point where it's like, what do we do now? Now we have to do something. Why? Because the pain of what we've always done is now greater than the pain of making those changes. There's so many times we, we need to change in our lives, we resist change, we, we don't like change, and it's totally understandable. But what you need to understand, what I need to understand, is that if we're going to move forward in 2020, there are things that we have to change. There's things that we have to stop doing. There's things that we have to get rid of. We've talked about some of that, right? Not listening to the lies, not living according to self. But then there are also things that we need to, to start doing. Living according to the Spirit. And I think one of the one of the things that we need to change, not just, not just even this year, but I think one of the things we need to change as a culture, as a society, one of the things that we need to change across the board is the way that we view community and the way that we view relationships. We have to change the way that we think about community. We have to change the way that we think about relationships because we live in a society that has never been more connected and yet at the same time never been more lonely. Like it's almost like an oxymoron, like jumbo shrimp. Like how is that, how is that possible? And yet that's the reality. And as I read the scripture, you know, one of the things that we're commanded to do is to be in relationship. One of the things that we were created to do is to be in relationship. There's a verse in, in the book of Hebrews and the author of Hebrews writes, and he says this, he says, look at, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. And I could just see him kind of going like this. You know who those some people are that he's talking about? Us. Today, let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but instead let us encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Let's not neglect being in relationship. 
Let's not fail to be, to be connected in community. Let us, let us not think that we can somehow do this life alone, but we need to understand that we need each other, that we were created for each other, that, that I need your encouragement and you need my encouragement. And if we don't do this together, we're not going to do anything. And that's, what, that's what he's saying. But, but we don't have that mindset today. Right? We live, we live in a society, like I said, where we're so connected and yet so alone. There, there's never been a time in history where we've been more connected, not just, not just, but around the world because of this. This changed everything. The internet changed everything. Changed the way we communicate. Changed the way we take in information. It changed, it changed literally how we travel. It cha- changed everything in our lives has changed in the last 25 years. And here we sit today, the most connected time in the history of mankind. And yet, how is it that during that same time, the rate of depression and anxiety and loneliness has also continued to increase? If we're this connected, then how are we so alone? Because it's a facade. Because it has the appearance of relationship, but it really has nothing at all. You know, what's, what's interesting to me is they've done, they've done studies. Do you know who the most relationally connected generation is right now? Boomers. Baby boomers are the most relationally connected. Do you know who the most isolated generation is? Gen Z. Gen Z. These are the kids who all day, are making TikTok videos to share. I don't even know what the heck TikTok is. Making videos to share with one another, chatting, Facebook, FaceTime, Instagram, all these other, Snapchat, I don't even know if Snapchat's still a thing, just shows you how old I am now. Like, I don't think I'm that old, but when I start talking to my 13-year-old, I'm like, man, I'm old. Gen Z, the, the, the youngest, they're, they're the ones who are the most lonely, yet they're the ones who are the most socially Connected. Like, how, how is that? And, and if we're going to change the way we view community, we have to stop substituting real relationships for likes and followers. We have to stop confusing a social presence with real community. We have to stop substituting a, a digital mindset for real, like, what's happening now? Stop substituting screen time for FaceTime. And I don't mean that app on your phone. I mean, actually sitting down with somebody face to face and having a conversation with them and all the young people are looking at me right now like, you are so old, dude. I know, I'm sorry. I think one of the things that we have to stop doing and and really me personally, is we have to stop confusing isolation with solitude. We have to stop isolating and saying, we're just seeking solitude. Because there's a difference in the two. Both of them we require withdrawing, but there's a difference in the purpose and then there's a difference in the outcome. See, the purpose of solitude is to get away, is to withdraw, is to get time with God, is to get a new perspective. This is encouraged throughout the scripture. Jesus himself at times said, let us go, alone. Let us go away alone. And then Jesus, even from his disciples, would go away alone and spend time in prayer. What was he doing? He was, he was seeking times of refreshing with God. It's solitude. It's healthy. It's good. The problem is when we isolate, it's to get away from, it's to avoid. Where, where, where solitude is refreshing, isolation is depleting. Where solitude is a gift from God, isolation is a tool of the enemy. In solitude, I'm hearing from God. In isolation, the enemy becomes my source. In solitude, I'm given a new perspective, but in isolation, he gives me a wrong perspective. We have to stop isolating ourselves, saying that we're doing it for our own good because we're not. We're avoiding we're avoiding for, for many different reasons. Fear of rejection. Well, I don't want to put myself out there because what if they don't like me? Fear of, fear of failure. 
fear of all these other things that, that keep us from really engaging in relationship. So Pastor John, what do I do? How do I do this? If, if, if I want to change my, my view of community, I want to change my view of relationship, if I want to commit to doing this together, what can I do moving forward? I'm glad you asked. If you're taking notes this morning, you can write these down. If you're not taking notes, you should probably write these down. The first thing that is this, the first thing that we need to do is, is understand that relationship must be a priority. You have to prioritize true relationship. And when I say relationship, again, I'm not talking about sitting there and texting somebody. Do you understand me? You're going to have to start annoying people. Because I understand, like right now at this time, the most annoying thing you can do to somebody is call them rather than text them. Like I get it. Like when my phone rings, I'm like, what do you want? Just text me. Right? How many of you guys do that? If you really want to annoy somebody, leave them a voicemail. But when I say relation, I mean like real engaged, real relationship, spending time with somebody. That has to be a priority. As we look at the scripture, there's, there's a couple of scriptures I want to show you. And there, there are scriptures that are familiar with most of us. The first one, Jesus is asked, what is the most important commandment in the law? And Jesus replies, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all of your mind. And the second is equal to it. What does he say? Love your neighbor as yourself. We know this as the greatest commandment, but then we also have the great commission, which is the last thing that Jesus left them with before he went into heaven in Matthew 28. He says, therefore go and make disciples of who? All nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can you make disciples without being in relationship? Was Jesus able to make disciples without being in relationship? If Jesus can't do it, why do you think you can do it? If Jesus needed relationship, why do you think you can do it on your own? If Jesus needed people surrounding him, what makes you think that you're the Lone Ranger and you don't need nobody? Jesus, Jesus needed community. Jesus needed people. He needed a community for himself, but he also needed community to do what he was called to do. It's the same for you and me. We need community. We need people that can pour into us. But we can't be who God created us to be and do what God created us to do if we're just out there by ourselves. We have to prioritize and, and make relationship a priority. The second thing is this. We have to embrace the give and take. And this is the part we really don't like. The give and take of relationship. Because a lot of times we just want the take What can I get? What do you have to offer me? And we don't want to we don't want to think about the give. We don't want to think about what this will require of us. But relationships are two way. We have to stop thinking of relationships just benefiting us, but instead think how can I be a benefit to somebody else? There's a portion of scripture I love. There's a story I love in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 14. The Israelites are fighting against the Philistines, and, and this is like four chapters, three chapters before David kills Goliath. But Saul is king, and his son Jonathan, they're, they're at war, and they're camped over here, and the Philistines are camped over there. And Jonathan gets this wild idea. Like he, he gets this, there's this crazy thought that I'm not even going to wait for the rest of the army. I'm just going to go by myself. Like I'm no military strategist. But if I was there, I'd say, Jonathan, that is the dumbest plan I've ever heard in my life. We've got thousands of soldiers. Why don't we just wait and we can all go together? That sounds like a plan. Let's try that. But that's not what happens. Look at what Jonathan says. He says, let's go across to the outposts of those pagans. <laughs> He's like just ready to pick a fight with them. He says this to his armor bearer. He says, perhaps the Lord will help us for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or a few. Now, if I'm the armor bearer, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but it's better with many warriors. Like, why, why do you want to try it with just a few when we have many? Like, 
yeah, options are good, Jonathan. But, but look at what he says. His armor bearer replies to him and says, do what you think is best. I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. Another translation says, I'm with you, heart and soul. Now, the armor bearer was an interesting position. There was, you know, kings, princes, important people in military had, had this position, this person that, that had a position called armor bearer. Now, the, the purpose of the armor bearer was to bear their armor. Sounds really complicated. Their job was to carry their swords, carry their spears, carry their weapons, carry their armor. Have you seen Jumanji? Not the, not the Robin Williams, but the newer ones. In the first Jumanji, there's the scene where they're going over the strengths and the weaknesses, right? And Kevin Hart, one, you know, he's like upset because strength is one of his weaknesses. And he's like, how can strength be a weakness? But one of his strengths was... Was, was weapons valet. And you remember there are scenes where they, they start getting into fights and he pulls, starts pulling all these things out of this backpack. Like, where did these even come? That was the armor bearer. Okay, what he would do is he would go with this person and when he needed a spear, he'd give him a spear. When he needed a sword, he'd hand him a sword. So this armor bearer was with Jonathan wherever, but he didn't have to. He could have been like, dude, here's your sword. Like, Go, but what does he say? He says, I'm with you completely. I'm with you heart and soul, whatever you think is best. He says, Jonathan, let's go. Now here's my question to you. Who do you have in your life that's with you heart and soul? Who do you have in your life that if you called them and said, hey, crazy idea, <laughs> here's what I feel like God is telling me to do, they would be like, let's do it. I'm with you. Whatever you need, I got your back. Who do you have that has your back like that? And part two of that question is whose back do you have like that? Who were you in relationship with that if they called you with some crazy idea, you would be like, let's do it. If God's told us to do it, yeah, many warriors or a few, doesn't matter because God's with us. Doesn't matter how crazy it sounds, I'm with you, I've got your back. It's a give and take and we have to learn to embrace that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says this, it says, so encourage one another and build each other up. That word encourage, I looked it up in the original Greek language. And it's a word that comes from two separate words. And these two words literally mean, one word is to be called. The other word is alongside of or beside. So this word encourage literally means to be called next to. So he's saying, encourage one another. What's he saying? Walk next to one another. Walk with each other. Do life with each other. Be in relationship with one another. But we don't, we don't do that. We don't walk next to each other. We walk on the other side of the street from one another. Like, hey, how's it going over there? Yeah, you, no, you stay there. No, you're fine. You're good. I can see from here. Like back in the day, I remember like when you came home and your neighbor was outside, what would you do? Hey, Bill, you'd go over and you'd have a conversation. Now you pull in and you try and run inside before Bill sees you. You see Bill walking across the street like, honey, turn off the lights, Bill's coming. Like, one, of the, one of the happiest things as a kid, I remember growing up, the, the greatest joys we ever got was when that doorbell rang. The doorbell rang and we'd go running to the door. Who is it? Do they want to play with me? Are they looking for me? Do they have something to tell me? Now what happens? The doorbell rings and we all just like hit the deck. Don't answer it. Don't, don't answer it. If it was important, they would have texted me. <laughs> we had to change the way that we think. We got to start walking next to one another. We have to start encouraging one another. We, we, we can't do that if we're not in relationship with one another. And the only way we'll be in relationship is if we start to embrace the give and take nature of it. We have to stop living so selfishly. Like, what can you give me in this relationship? And start focusing on what I can give you in this relationship. Because you can either be a life sucker or a life giver. 
and nobody likes life suckers. A lot of sucky people out there. Just sucking the life. What, what does that look like? We all know what it looks like. It's that person when they come into church, you're just kind of like. Not that that's any of you guys. That's the second service crowd. But they're, all, they're, they're always, always taking. I need this. I want this. Help me. They're never reciprocating what's given. A healthy relationship is give and take. It's back and forth. We have to understand that. It's not just what can you pour into me, but what can I then pour back into you? Nobody likes Debbie Downers. Everyone wants to be around encouragers. You know who one of my favorite people to hang around with is? She's sitting right down here on the front row, my sister-in-law, Ashley. She's the, the, the greatest encourager I've ever met in my entire life. Like when I get done preaching and I think it's terrible, you know what I'll do? I'll go to Ashley. Like, Ashley, what'd you think of the message? Oh my gosh, Sean, that was the greatest thing I've ever heard so much there. God spoke so much. And I'm like, okay, that's all I needed to know. Like it could have been the worst thing ever. I could have totally bombed. It could have totally flopped. Like, I, I wouldn't even say two words. And Ashley would be like, John, that was amazing. I don't know how. I love hanging out with people like that. You know who I don't like hanging out with? We all know because it's the person that you're thinking of right now. And if you're sitting next to that person, don't elbow them. Just, just leave it. But we don't, we, we don't like hanging around them, but we have to learn to embrace. It's give and take. And this is so important in relationships. And I think this is why so many of us avoid relationships, either because we've been burned or haven't got what we thought we should have gotten in relationship. But I think this is why so many marriages fail. It's because we don't understand the give and take. We get into a relationship and think that it's the other person's job to fill my cup. It's not their job to fill your cup. It's not their job to be your source. It's not their job to make you happy. It's not their job to make you fulfilled. If you start putting those requirements and expectations on them, you know what's going to happen. They're going to let you down because they can't do that. The only person that can do that is God. And until he's your source, they will always let you down. And so it's, it's a give and take. And it's so important in marriage, understanding that if God is my source and I don't need angel to be my source of joy, I don't need angel to be my source of purpose or fulfillment. If I already have that from him, then that frees me up to just love angel. I don't, I don't expect anything from angel. I don't, I don't need anything because he's my source. So that frees me up to rather than what can angel give to me, now what can I give to her? Because I'm already full from him. He is my source. It's this, it's this give and take. And what I've learned in my 14 years, next month, 14 years of marriage, crazy, crazy, 14 years. What I've learned in my 14 years is this. The quickest way to fill my cup is to make sure that her cup is full. And it's not just in marriage, but it's every relationship. If you're in relationship, the quickest way to fill your cup is to fill somebody else's cup. Because when my cup is full, you know what I want to do? I want to just fill everybody. Like I'm feeling loved, I'm feeling good, I'm happy, oh, this, is, this is awesome. What can I give to you when I'm down? You know what it is? I need somebody. I, I need somebody to pour into me. I need some encouragement. I need some strength. Somebody come alongside of me, heart and soul. Somebody come and pick me up. But when I'm full, what do I do? Just give and I give and I give and I give. It's this give and take. And then the last thing, and this is kind of just like a final thought that I had. Understand the season that you're in. If we're going to change the way we view community, relationship, if we're going to move forward in this together in 2020, Understand the season you're in. Now, now listen, don't hear what I'm not saying, okay? 
What I'm not saying is this, Pastor, you're right. It's just, it's just a busy season and I don't have time for people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you're really busy right now so you don't have to join a small group. Don't worry about discipleship on Wednesdays. And if you only come to church once a month, that's fine. You're busy. We understand that. That's not what I'm saying, okay? I always, always trip out when, when, when young people come into my office. 2021, Pastor John, I just, you know, I would like to. I just don't have enough time. Explain to me this whole, I don't have enough time thing. Well, I just, I'm just, I'm just so busy. Okay, I, I, I empathize with that. Tell me, what does your schedule look like? I get up at eight and I go to work. How long, how, how long do you, usually like five hours. Okay, what do you do after work? Well, then I have to go to class. Okay, how long is class? Well, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's an hour and a half. And then on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, it's two and a half hours. Okay, so what time do you get home? Like 4.30? So what do you do after that? I mean, then it's, you know, I got I, video games, TV, and, you know, then, then, it's, then it's free time. Oh, free time. Explain to me what free time is. Like, tell me again how busy you are. And I always tell them, you know, I always tell them, listen, you will never have more time than you do right now. You are so busy, but you will never in your life, never have more free time than you have right now. And then people, people who start having kids come. Like, Pastor John, I'm just, I'm so busy. I mean, I get it. Like, you know, kid kept me up till two o'clock last night. I got to change diapers. I got to do this. Like, I, I totally understand that. Like, I think back in, in our, on our two-year anniversary, me and Angel had a year and a half old, and, and Zay was almost six, six months. And so, like, I get being married and having little kids around in the time that is associated with that. Like, I, I understand that. But even the, the parents with the little kids come in and they want to talk about how they don't have time. I was like, okay, so explain to me what, what you have going on. Because now I have a 13-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 7-year-old, and they all want to have their own lives. So now I, I just don't have my own schedule to worry about. I have their schedule to worry about. And I coach a select baseball team. And we, you know, all of these other things that we have going on. And we lead a church and I'm married. And there's this, all this stuff going on. And so, so what I've found is that every season of my life, you know what I do? I go from busy to busier. Just a different kind of busy. And I go from busier to busy And And... <laughs> And I'm hoping that one day that scale starts, that bell curve starts to come back down a little bit. But what I'm, what I'm not saying is that, listen, we're all busy. I read something this week that, that busyness is not a sign of productivity. It's simply a sign that you can't manage your life. We want to think about busyness as this medal of honor that we wear. Like, I'm just so busy. And he said... He said, busyness is not a sign of productivity. It's a sign that we can't manage our lives. You're not too busy for relationship. Because here we are with everything that we have going on, and yet you know what we do? We make time for it. Why? Because it's a priority for us. Why? Because we know we can't move forward alone. Why? Because we've chosen to refuse isolation. Yes, at times embrace solitude, but recognize I can't do and I can't be who God made me to be and do what he called me to do if I'm by myself. I need people that can pour into me and people that I can pour into. So what do you mean by this? Closing. What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean by understand the season you're in? Listen, it, it's important for us to be, to be somewhat self-aware emotionally. Well, you're supposed to be talking to me about spiritual things. Yes, I'm trying to, to encourage you in every part of your being, spiritually, emotionally, healthy, uh, physically, relationally, every, every area I want you to grow in. It's important for us to be self-aware because I need to understand the season of life that I'm in because there are seasons that we go through. And there's a season where, where things are hard and I just need somebody to encourage me. David understood this. 
hiding in the cave. David knew there are seasons. And if I just had somebody that could just, just encourage me in this. And so, so recognize what season are you in. There, there are seasons of my life. You know what I found? There are seasons in my life where things are going great. And when things are going great, I don't need the encourager because I do a good job encouraging myself. But when things are going great, you know who I need? I need somebody to come and poke me. Say, what's really going on? How are you really doing? No, things are going great. Okay, yeah, fine. Things are going great. How's your marriage? As a parent, how's that going? How's your relationship with your kids? To go below the surface. Yes, surface level, things are great, but I need somebody to challenge me to make sure that I don't get complacent with where I am. There are different seasons of my life where I need somebody to come and play a role depending on where I am. That's why you need to understand where you are and what season you're in because based on that season, you'll know who to surround yourself with. Do I need an armor bearer? Do I need an encourager? Do I need somebody to challenge me? Do I need an iron sharpener? Do I need, do I need accountability partners? Is there something that I'm struggling with and, and I need somebody to, to keep me to the fire? What, what do I need in my life? Because you'll never find that by yourself. You'll only find that in relationship. And the only way that we can move forward in 2020 is to link arms and move forward together. Amen? Stand with me this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word today. Jesus, I thank you for the example that, that you laid out for us. Because if, 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 if you needed community, and if you came and established community and sought out community, then, then who are we to think that we can do it on our own? Lord, I thank you for, for the relationships that you've placed in my life. God, I thank you for the encouragers that can can bring that word and lift my spirits. God, I thank you for those accountability partners that that sharpen me and keep me sharp. Lord, I thank you for those that will come and and poke just to to keep me from getting complacent and always challenge me to keep moving forward. Lord, for for so many of us, we've we've fallen into this trap of, of culture and society that we have the, this thought that, well, if I have this many followers and I get this many likes and I have this many conversations via social media, then I'm so connected and yet, God, we're so isolated. Lord, we, we, we thank you for those times of solitude and times of, of being alone with you and withdrawing, even as Jesus did. But God, for those of us that are here isolating for one reason or another, because we've been hurt or because we're afraid of rejection. God, whatever that reason is, Lord, I pray that that as we move forward into this year, that you would would change our mindset. You would change the way we view relationships and view community. And rather than it being about what can I get from it, may our first thought be what can I give to it? How can I pour into somebody? How can I be a blessing to somebody else? Rather than how can I get more friends, how can I be more of a friend? Lord, as we go this week, I pray that that you would help us to find those armor bearers, help us to find those encouragers, help us to find those iron sharpeners. Lord, if we need to join a small group, I pray that you would place that on our heart. There are directories out there in the lobby that, that we can grab today and go and and find a group of people that we can link arms with and move forward together. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some do. But Lord, may we be a true picture of what community really looks like and really is. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. Hey, reminder, four o'clock this afternoon, we'll be back here for a family meeting. If you guys want to come back, that would be fantastic. If not, uh, go Titans. Our prayer team is down here if there's anything that you have need of. Love you guys. Have a great week.